What's up guys, welcome to the Metal Roofing Channel. I'm Thad Barnett. Today we're talking about installation mistakes that we still see on a regular basis, both from a commercial and residential side. And to help me out, I've got Jason and Dave from the Sheffield Metals Technical Department to help me out. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you. Hey, Thad, how are you? I'm doing well. Good. So we're talking installation today, and uh, you guys see all kinds of installations all over the country, all over the world, really. So you really see what standard practices are out there and kind of where certain areas of an install still kind of trip people up. So that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. So why don't we start with some of the most common things that you guys see during inspections and during the course of a project um, that gives people some trouble when it comes to the install. Yeah, the first thing that I see the most often is fasteners and accessories. And this is really based off of our uh, testing uh, wind uplift, but is the ultra low or ULP fasteners. So when people are using ultra low profile fasteners, you know, how does that make a difference to the install? Is it just not what is required with our engineering? Is, is it confusing to use those different uh, fasteners? You know, what's the kind of the issue there? We haven't, we haven't done the UL580, you know, uplift testing to see how that fastener performs. So when it comes to meeting the wind uplift requirements of a project, it needs to be a, a true pancake head fastener in lieu of the ultra low profile. So it just really comes down to the proper accessory selection, making sure what is tested is what, in, is, what is being used on the assembly. Correct, especially in where the most of the country that has you know high velocity zones where you really need to meet wind uplift requirements, you really need to check uh, the testing and what fasteners were, were used with that test. I think a lot of people use the ultra low profile heads because the, you know, they're, they don't run the risk of fasteners telegraphing through the panel. But what are some ways that you can avoid that in your panel manufacturing or the, or the clip selection? How do you avoid sure. those panel or those heads going through the panel? Well, it's definitely, yes, uh, clip selection. You can have the dimples in the clip that help hide the fastener. You also have the clip relief on the panel are the two prim primary options that we recommend. Dave, why don't I kick it over to you? There's another thing that we see with installation issues that may be reoccurring from building owners, and I think it's the expectations of install. This is kind of a nuanced topic. Can you talk to me a little bit about this? Yeah, I think there's a lot of expectations when we talk about a metal roof. Everybody loves the aesthetic of a metal roof, performance of a metal roof. And the sweet spot is that quality, performance, and aesthetic. When we have, when we look at like that three circle design, that sweet spot in the middle of those three circles is key to having everybody get what they want. What's very difficult is when it's not what they want. And very rarely is the metal roof perfect. And that's what they, you know, a lot of people think that that's what they bought or that's the way it should be performed or that's not what it looked like on the blueprints or that's not what it looked like in the three dimensional drawing that they you know, rendered from the very beginning of the project. Sometimes there's some there's some issues with the expectations, and then I think there's some expectations between the bid process and the in job performance. A lot of people think that there's expectations on a on a specific panel profile. You're going to get the right performance out of it, whether that's pitch or longevity or just the assembly itself. And those things don't always come together in a perfect manner. Sometimes they do, but part of the issue is we hear a lot more bad news than the good news. So there's a lot of projects that from the very beginning go well and end well. The issue is there's a whole lot more noise about the bad projects where expectations aren't met. It tends to give a little bit of a, a dark spot to the metal roofing industry, unfortunately. A lot of times people think they know what they want. There's an expectation. For instance, I know we've looked at a project I think Jason was looking at one where they, they think they want a 12 inch wide panel. And I'm not sure it's hard to, to peel back the layers of onion on why they think they want a 12 inch wide panel when it's, it's not efficient as far as the material. It's not efficient as far as the labor. I don't know what they're trying to render from a 12 inch panel as far as the aesthetics, but it's, it's a little bit prohibitive for a manufacturer just to try to dig in and say, you know, why, but 
it's it's really not very cost effective to to do a 12 inch wide panel on any sort of that selective mode on how they got to that point. So expectations are hard, uh, especially with homeowners. They want their house. They're, they're certainly monetarily invested. They're emotionally invested in their house and they think they want the perfect metal roof. That's so hard to do from a sales standpoint to say, Hey, you know, we're selling you a metal roof. We expect it to be perfect when there's no perfect metal roof unfortunately there's no perfect house there's there's you know nothing perfect so expectations are very very difficult to achieve yeah so what's some advice that you have for an installer you know how how can i communicate with the building owner homeowner gc whoever it might be to really set those expectations ahead of time I think you said the magic words that we say it all the time, communication. You know, I don't want to say set the expectations low and overperform, but that's probably your best solution to get to that that end result of everybody being happy. We don't want contractors to lose money based on tear it all off and try again. That's a horrible scenario because that just delays the construction process, costs a whole lot of money. It's hard to stay in business if that's what you're doing all the time, but um, that communication is super important. Metal roofing doesn't go on nearly as fast as shingles. I mean, a lot of residential houses can they can shingle that you know a house in a day or or two days. A metal roof doesn't go on that fast. If the expectations are kind of set on that on a day one of say a dozen panels, twelve panels, six panels, whatever it is, say hey, this is what it's going to look like. Are you okay with this? I think that's that's a really good uh, way to resolve some issues or, or, or cut the problem off in the beginning to make sure that nobody is expecting more than what they're going to get. It's very, very difficult, but it all comes down to timing. So got to make sure your communication's on point, the timing's right, make sure everybody has an understanding of what those expectations are. And, and it, look, nobody wants to fall short of expectations. That, that's not a purposeful life. Right. You don't you don't want to tell and you don't want to make too many promises, but communicating that it's not going to be perfect is, is very, very hard. But the facts are the facts. There's no perfect metal roof, but doing the best you can is isn't always what somebody wants to hear. In, in the residential environment, definitely discussing with the homeowner the details, getting detail approval. They might have a different expectation of what they're going to get. And after it's installed, it's too late. Right, because we have such an educated customer base anymore. We've talked about that for for years, and and you know, part, part of our our deal with the metal roofing channel is is sending out knowledge. It's good. It does come with some repercussions that we're we're educating people. And I tell our customer, our direct customers, the installers, that look, our customers are informed, and if you don't use our details, their expectations are set right on our website which is unfortunate and fortunate. And so um, it makes it difficult. And Jason makes a great point. Yeah, let's get a little bit more concrete and actually talk about some of those details and, and some of the issues that we see or that you guys see on a daily basis. Jason, talk to me a little bit about Z closure install, especially in flashing zones and, and kind of what you see there. So the biggest issue we see on Z closure installation, and this is vertical installations, sidewalls, rakes, where the it's reverse lapped uh, as they work up the roof. So a lot of installers are looking at it down, thinking of the horizontal surfaces of the Z flashing, you know, at the panel and up top. And actually, we're looking at the vertical lap of a sidewall or rake condition and it's reverse lapped because everyone's learned you know you install flashings from the bottom up you know from the eve up lowest to highest but actually on on these vertical z closure installations you actually do top down to create a proper water lap on the vertical exterior exposed portion of the z closure yeah and, and that's the word that helps me remember it is the exterior lap, whereas the interior inside the envelope there, that's that reverse lap condition that you're talking about that kind of trips people up. So it's where the water will be on the exterior of those Zs. Absolutely. If I finished product, what does that Z closure look like? So that's one of the big ones. And then the other ones are any typical miter condition, hips to ridge, 
side walls to head walls or any combination of those, it gets tricky. You know, that's where the devil's in the details and everything's great until you're, you're trying to change a direction. So when those flashing zones come together, you know, what what are the issues that people run into with miters? Is it not cutting them right? Is it lapping inc- incorrectly? You know, what's the problems? Once again, working low to high, you want to have your vertical Z closures on before your horizontal Z closures. So hips and side walls should be in place for head walls or ridge. And you want those flashings to extend beyond your horizontal. And it's not just a cut miter. I see a lot of people just want to cut the Z and miter it. That creates a, a zero point at the actual uh, miter condition. And we're trying to get full full coverage weather tight uh, through those conditions. Okay, and what about some actual details that people use in installs, maybe because they're they're faster or it's a way they've always done it. Dave, one, one thing that we see often is CZs or modified Zs. Talk to me about that a little bit. It's been in the industry for quite some time. And originally I absolutely put my foot down and said it had no place in the industry. We ran into some issues on a couple projects where it actually came in a little bit handy on top of a roof at a soffit condition, but very rarely is that ever a solution. Modified Z, because of its inherent condition and and how you integrate the, the, the bottom of the panel with a bit of a tongue on, on the flat of the panel that slides into the modified Z, the panel attachment to keep the panel from sliding down, we use five fasteners in our intermittent Zs uh, when we close out the tops of the panels. And that's for a couple different reasons. A, it's it's a compression with the fasteners and butyl and the Z closure. Uh, that makes a great compression seal at the top of the panel. It also holds the panel on the roof, keeps it from sliding, especially where we are at, all of us basically. In snow country, the monolithic sheet of, of snow has an unbelievable drag force on it. And Most of the time, what I have seen in the past is somebody will put one screw through the top side of the modified Z into the panel, and it barely hits the panel, and it's one screw. I don't feel that that generates enough static force to keep the panel up on the roof for the longevity of the roof system, which should be at least 60 years. The modulation of the panel can decrease the the compression of that screw and back that screw out and tear the metal. I have dealt with panels that slid off a roof at a forestry service building in the mountains of Colorado. And there's no pushing the panels back up. We weren't able to do it. I don't know if anybody's been able to do it. It's very, very difficult. And that really impeded my thought process to ever use that again, because it doesn't equip the system with the amount of resistance to drag force with the modified Z. I know there's a couple of manufacturers that are using it on, on sidewall. I can't really you know, endorse that. Is it a way to do it? It is. Just I would I would really caution people from using that when that's that hasn't been a, a, a method of longevity uh, in our industry. Okay, and I think one of the thing in regards to installation that people might think is an installation mistake, but is really just bad design. Dave, let me go back to you on this one again. Tell me a little bit about why design is so important and how that can affect the perception of the install later on. Design comes down to panel selection. I have a picture of a residential house. It's a large house up in the mountains. And you just look at it and you say, oh, it's a really good house. And then you start looking at where the shading is and how much water is coming down in a certain area. And the windows are less than four inches off the roof line. And it's prohibitive to a contractor to install the roof because they're going to end up with problems. It's inherent to the build. Anytime a building leaks, who are they going to call? The roofer. So categorically, the panel selection provides you know, instill some confidence in in what they're going to, if it's a low slope condition, it should be a mechanical lock. Sometimes that mechanical lock becomes its historical design. Like that's what they, they've, we've used, you know, in, in a a long time ago, a hundred years ago, that's what we use as a mechanical lock. Sometimes that historical look is what people want, but it's probably not the best solution, you know, for the installation of a particular residence or, or business. 
and it's not necessarily cost effective on a 12 12 on a steep roof system to do a mechanical so that that design might not necessarily meet the performance so that's that's one criteria i think design also there's some intuitive things with with the design process to make sure that the assembly makes sense you know that's that's part of it as well um, not all panels uh, meet the criteria of a certain assembly, which is, you know, prohibitive to the longevity of the system. Uh, it could invoke a whole lot more money uh, onto the budget. It might not have been budgeted by the contractor. So the contractor is going to be, you know, pinched and where are they going to cut corners? So there's, there's a lot of things that go into it. And then we circle back around. That all has to be communicated. We always seem to get right back to communication, whether it's, the, the pieces and parts that Jason has, has described with the issues, those things need to be communicated. It's, it's amazing how everything comes back to communication. All right, thanks, Dave and Jason. I really appreciate the time. If you've got any questions, comment down below or visit SheffieldMetals.com to view our installation manuals, engineered profiles, and details there. Subscribe here to the Metal Roofing Channel. As always, I'm Thad Barnett. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>